Welcome back to the latest round of BSA Firebird restoration and this video we're going to be looking at the front and rear wheels, brakes and any other associated components. Now when I was stripping the bike, if you recall, if you've watched the previous videos, feel free to go back and catch up if you haven't. I couldn't work out how this was meant to come off at the time. Well, now I've got the wheel on the bench, it's fairly obvious that the cable's got to pull through that, which will then come back out this way to release it. However, because the cable is seized, I can't get the inner cable through there enough to do it. So, my only option is to cut the cable, which I'm going about to do now with the air cut-off tool, which might be... Uh, a little bit noisy. Just make sure the compressor's off. Sorry about that, took a little bit longer than expected because I hadn't uh, adjusted it since the last time I used it. Anyway, the tyre I had to cut off or at least cut the edge off so I could get the tyre levers to do it a bit more easily because it was completely, utterly fossilised. It looks to be the original Dunlop K70 fitted at the factory, uh, which again ties in with the 4,000 miles on the clock because it's uh, barely worn. But as I say, completely and utterly fossilised. It's rock hard. Right, anyway. I think the easiest thing for me to do will be cut it here because I want to make sure that's going to pull off freely. I want to see from there. I don't want to be pulling the spring back and cutting it there because I don't know, I might be able to get to it. I was going to say it might be a bit tight. No, but why risk the potential of damaging the uh, facing of this thing? So I'm going to cut it here first, see what. <laughs> and quick. So that will still be hot. Hey, now we're laughing. So that should pull out of there, which it does. Hooray. Keep the spring. And that still doesn't want to come out of there. What is going on? Oh, there we go. There we go. It's a bit tight. Let me just get the, uh, the model grips and try and push it through. It's just a bit stiff in there. Yeah, there we go. Actually, very easy with mole grips. In which case, that should come out of there with the washers. Yeah, and as I thought, it's slotted. So, in theory, you only have to push the cable through enough to allow that to pass through and how it comes with its two washers. Very good. The back one should just be a simple push through, which it is. Large size for your cable end. Excellent. Right. That leaves getting this off. Now I'm going to try and find a nut that will fit um, a nut, a spanner that will fit that. I'm not sure what size it is. These brakes not sure it's meant to do that either. Surely the anyway, we shall see when we open up. These brakes will contain asbestos. So I will take the back plate off and immediately take it outside and clean it off with the brake cleaner. Same with the hub, the drum. So I know there's no nasty... Uh, can you see my breath in the... Uh, I don't know if you want to see my breath in the video. 
it's January, end of, and uh, we've just had a massive snowstorm outside. Anyway, yeah, uh, I want to make sure there's no chance of me accidentally inhaling any asbestos dust, that's for sure. So I'll see what I can find to uh, fit this. Onto the back wheel then. As it came off the bike. So. There's your shoes. So before we go any further. Get it all get in there. Just out of interest, I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine when I was buying the uh, brake cleaner and uh, he said, why do you bother having separate brake and carb cleaner? Which is a very good question. Uh, and the answer, it turns out, despite them being virtually the same stuff, is that brake cleaner is guaranteed to be oil free, whereas uh, carb cleaner, some of them have got a light, very light oil mixed in with them to provide lubrication and cleaning. So there you go. I never really thought about it until you mentioned it. Anyway, really bog standard British layout, a couple of springs, single cam, what fat bog standard rear brake layout for whoever makes the bloody things, never mind the British. Nothing unusual about it at all. Riveted brake shoes, plenty of meat on them. I'll take them off and clean everything up in a second, but I'm guessing they will be original. One Mart L, one Mart T. Hmm, which must be top and lower, mustn't it? Can't think of anything else. Anyway, T is next to the uh, brake anchor point, and L is next to the uh, pivot, which appears to be seized. Another reason why it's all going to have to come apart. So there you go. For my own memory's sake, with the brake anchor sitting upright, the T is on the right hand side. Just in case I forget in the coming times. Let me just get a cloth. Make sure all the uh, all the old dust has in fact been soaked out of this thing. I think it probably has. Yes, there's loads of brake fluid in the bottom there. Let's just clean it out. Gonna have to go in a parts washer. Right, so bolt on sprocket, which looks can you see that? It looks pretty unworn. We'll check again when it's properly cleaned off, but it looks pretty good. Our bearing retaining ring, which again nothing has been on those. Because even using the right tool, they uh, can go oval. I think we'll be taking those out to have a look. They sound a bit, a bit rough. So we'll get the sprocket off next. So 
7 16th. Right, you don't need to see me undoing all of these, so I'll bring you back when it's off. Right, five bolts. On the other side of the flange there's a washer and a steel locking nuts, which should all clean up nicely. And then the next problem is the sprocket stuck on the drum. So, I'm going to, uh, can you see that? No, you can't. Let's bring you up a little bit. How's that? Right. So, I need to come at it from the back with a chisel and just give it... Yes, that's moving. Give it a few taps. Encourage it to come off. Let's keep the movement equal. Tight little cells, haven't it? one sprocket to go in the parts washer. Right, so on the other side of the wheel let's just bring it down again we have our speedo drive which should we just popped off, but for some reason doesn't want to. So I think a tire wrench and a little bit of gentle pressure and just see what happens. Something's going. shouldn't be like this, it should be a straightforward push on. There we go. Two driving dogs inside. A spacer. That's your uh, connection. There. You can see the bearing, which actually looks quite good. Still got plenty of grease in it. Maybe I'll re-grease it on another side. That looks that looks remarkably good. The hub is marked up LF LH for left-hand thread, so presumably that unscrews. Well, you'd have to get the bearing out. So let me just put this to one side. Let me just turn it off again. I'm pretty certain I've got a C spanner that might go in there, so I'll have a look. The sprocket has cleaned up well and is essentially unmarked. No recognizable wear there really, so that's going to go back on. The back plate has got some uh, markings on it so that's going to be rubbed down and painted. As I thought the cam is completely solid. Now there's a threaded hole here which makes me think a uh, grease nipple should have been fitted but there isn't one and there isn't one shown in the parts book. Uh, so 
I'm going to have to get this out, clean it all up, and then I think I will find a grease nipple and put it in anyway. Because even if it doesn't allow access for a gun where it sits, which it may not, at least it will plug that hole, which I think has contributed to this going rusty and sticking. So the first job is to get this off, and then uh, we'll try and get that pin out. And just see if that is uh, possible. So let me go and get the sockets, and I'll bring you back when I pop that nut off. Okay, it is a indiscriminate size, nine sixteenth. I loosened it before we came back, just so we can speed things up a little bit. Now then, now we need to get that spring off, but I think I'll give this a couple of little taps first, just to see if we can encourage it to wiggle off the... which we can. Doing it this way because I'm a bit worried about the strength of that spring. So it looks a bit cat handed, but it's probably the safest way. Right, they can now go in the parts for cleaning and painting, which leaves us with our stock spindle. Now then, I think. Safest method will be to try and get some grips on there first. Having put a little bit of a WD-40 down there. Let's see if that will encourage any movement. And if not, Safely on there. I don't want to damage the faces of these. But obviously, need to get a bit of a grip on it. Yes, that's okay. Oh my word, no! Right. Uh, right, it's going to be heat. I'm hoping that the alloy will have expanded quicker than the steel. And it has. Good old. Right. It's turning. As you can see. Hopefully. But it don't want to come out. So... Temporarily 
reattach the nut. And I'll just take it over to the vise and give it a little tap. Right, it's come out even further. Can't get any further with the nut, so I'm using our soft. Hammer, let's take it out even further. Hopefully the grips will pull it this time. Still reluctant. Nope. Right. I'll take it back to the vise and get a punch on that and knock it through. There we go. Rusty, not horrendously rusty, but rusty. Obviously enough. So I'll clean that up. I'll get some uh, abrasive paper in there, clean that up, and make sure it's well greased before it goes back in, and try and find a, a bleed nipple, and I'll paint that. So I'll just bring you back when all that's done, because uh, it's all pretty straightforward stuff. Right, I've now purchased the correct size socket for that. So hopefully that will now come on when I do that. But before we move on to that, quick word on the uh, brake drum. Now, I was a little puzzled that my bike's uh, 71. And according to the uh, books I'd read up till this point, the 71 should have had a polished alloy backplate. This one clearly isn't. So more research produced the information that the Firebird Scrambler in 71, some of them were fitted with a black backplate, even though the road going lightning and thunderbolts had plain alloy backplates. However, this one appears to be crinkle black as opposed to flat black, which is, uh, again, I haven't yet discovered which one's got the crinkle black. So further mysteries and further example of how hard it is to get any reasonable information about BSAs of this period, because there appears to have been lots of mixing and matching going on. But anyway, I've absolutely no doubt that this is original. None at all. Uh, given the rest of the bike, I'm pretty certain this must have been how it came out. Uh, the crinkle black's in pretty good nick. I'll just touch it up in a couple of small places. Uh, so we need to get inside now and find out why that's doing that, because I'm sure it's not meant to. Maybe they are. I don't know. I'll just find out when again. You would imagine they would have been under some sort of tension, but anyway, I don't know is the answer. I've never done one of these, I don't know. Uh, so it's a voyage of discovery. So let's just see if this will come off. I don't imagine it will want to for one second. But I was wrong yet again. relatively easy. Right, now, the uh, brake plate should just now pull off, but I'm not going to pull it off until I get my brake cleaner, because these will have asbestos in them. I was going to do it outside, like I mentioned earlier in the video, but it's absolutely freezing again. Uh, so I'm just going to rely on soaking everything as it comes out. Right. Is in 
indeed soaked, so let me get some paper to wipe out any dust. Because it's the dust that will kill it. So, the drum is perfect, there's not any sign of a wear lip at all, nothing, which is good, standard bearing retaining ring like you get in all these BSA Triumphs of this period, and earlier I think, I think it's uh, been around for a long time. I don't currently have a tool to do these. It's clearly never been up again because they are completely unmarked, undistorted. So again, that's all original. I need to find out how big these holes are. So let me go and find something to measure that first. Right, I was hoping there were four milli because I've got some four milli pins somewhere. But they're not, because that's a four milli bolt and they won't fit in. So it looks like I'm going to have to buy the proper tool, which upsets me because uh, it's 20 quid and I'm tight. Right, that can go to one side. And let's look at our bolt assembly and see what we got. Shoes are in uh, remarkably good condition. Not loads of meat on them, no bad scores, nothing. So again, it fits in. That's our two pivots. So that movement that way is, uh, is fine. Perfectly normal, which is good. That's all working. There are adjusting screws that are accessed from outside. On eccentrics. So let me just try turning them. Lovely. So they work. Right, I will strip that further. I'll just check the spring positions. So they both go on the underside and they're opposite each other lengthwise. Yep. So if I remember that the long one fits near the air trumpet and obviously the opposite long one fits on the other side, so hopefully I won't forget that. Now then, how, how easy, oh, I was going to say how easily will these come off. Oh, not that easily. I thought I was doing well there for a minute. There we go. There we go. So there's your adjusters. Springs and shoes.
pistons for all the adjusters which I'm cleaning up. Right. Everything will go in the parts washer, get cleaned, greased and reassembled because I've no intention of uh, no intention of changing them. The paint on the springs is completely unmarked, they normally go rusty very quickly. Right, I shall box these up until I'm ready to uh, clean them and bring you back then. Right, I wasn't going to bring you back to show you this process because uh, in theory it should have been simple. I just wanted to remove the back tyre and the rear rim so I can clean it. Unfortunately, due to a combination of the tyre itself being completely fossilised and the two, which frankly is ridiculous overkill in my opinion, but two rim locks which had not even been fitted properly, they were seized in the rim. So you couldn't get the lip down because you couldn't get them to move far enough away to break the bead all the way around. So I had to get brutal with the air cutoff tool. I managed to lever enough down finally to be able to get it right in to cut one side of the steel reinforced bead, which gave me enough room to then lever around them, which eventually got them free, which allowed me enough room to then get the second part of the uh, steel reinforced bead on the other side cut, and finally they came off. Total time about 40 minutes. <laughs> 